Start by saying a little bit about the uh, MIT Club of uh, Northern California. It turns out that there's uh, 14,000 of us here, MIT alums, which is the largest uh, agglomeration of MIT alums outside of uh, outside of California. It makes sense. It's outside of Boston, so everybody graduates and come here to start companies. And um, we're a nonprofit, completely volunteer-led. Um, uh, we. Uh, we actually raise money for the MIT Scholarship Fund with the target of sending six students every year to MIT on a, on a uh, post-scholarship under research Bay Area students. Um, and uh, we were having a discussion with the leadership on you know, what kind of events do we want to start uh, hosting. Of course, in-person event came up, and uh, we looked at also the domains. So we've got uh, various tracks. And this was originally run as a healthcare and life sciences track. Actually, Amar here on the panel used to run it before I did, when I ran it from 2017 to 2020, Kalina jumped in last year. And this year we started looking and um, turned out that post-COVID there's been a 38x increase in virtual interactions. And I started scratching my head. Well, it makes sense to start a new digital health track. And so this is the first in a series of events. We're gonna start with uh, AI and chronic care. Um, we've got another event coming up on November 1st in the same uh, venue on mental health. We've also got uh, telegenetic and genetic counseling coming up in December, a, uh, a payer event in February um, on value-based care, are we there yet? And a whole other sequence of events that are happening. Now for that to happen, you don't want to sit and look at me for all of these events, so I need volunteers. So after the, the, um, the actual uh, talk, I'd love to meet with people who would uh, be, uh, be open to hosting an event and help organize some more of these events. But to kick this off, I wanted to actually get a free dinner for everyone, so my startup <coughs> verbal sponsored dinner. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, going forward, we actually charge a small fee so we can actually fund the, uh, our scholarship fund and our endowment. But we're delighted to see everyone here. So um, thank you again, let's get started with the panel. <coughs> so as I was thinking of the panel, I really wanted to have a product person, I wanted to have an entrepreneur, I wanted to have a payer, I wanted to have a medical doctor, and I wanted to have a patient counted all that, that's like seven people, but we're actually, it happens. So in, in the four people that we have, so we're extremely fortunate to have the panel here with us. Um, and uh, before I actually introduce each member of the panel, I'll hand it off to introduce it to them. I, I, I got very optimistic. I wrote three pages of items that we want to get through. I don't think it would. So uh, I, I want to survey the audience first, the three topics that we want to focus on. Who wants to hear most about 
product market fit, product design. Raise your hands. Okay. Who wants to hear about AI, data science? Um, okay, okay, interesting. So maybe two to one ratio. And then who really wants to hear about go to market and scaling of digital startups? Yeah. This is really balanced. Okay, I was hoping it would bias us in one direction. Like, okay, we'll try to spend a third of the time on each of the one. But um, with no further comment, I'm going to pass it over to our first panelist, Amar. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Amar Kendale. I'm a, an MIT class of 2000 uh, alum, mechanical engineering. Uh, I stayed for my master's, uh, also at Mackey and graduated in 02. Uh, I've spent my entire career in healthcare innovation. Uh, right out of MIT, I joined a startup uh, that was focused on material science applied to biological problems and went on to do a series of startups, everything from biopharma to medtech, uh, consumer wellness and health. And in 2014, I joined a company called Livongo uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, it was just after they raised the Series A, uh, and I was with that company as their chief product officer through their public offering in 2019, their acquisition in 2020 by Teladoc. I was the chief product officer at Teladoc uh, for a period of time. And I'm currently uh, a co-founder and president of a company called Homeward Health. Homeward is focused on rural communities and the massive health disparities that are experienced by people who live at a distance from the kinds of healthcare resources that we're all you know, able to access more readily. So think half as many primary care doctors, about an eighth as many specialists uh, in a population that's geographically dispersed. And uh, it's an area that really lends itself, in fact, needs technology to be a part of the solution. That we that we build and offer uh, in order to, to close these gaps in uh, in the way healthcare is working, uh, and um, and uh, I'm happy to talk you know in the course of this conversation about any and all of the above of the topics that uh, Hashem spoke about. Um, I had the the privilege of being at Lavongo through the entire journey from uh, the beginning when we were trying to figure out product market fit, starting with diabetes focused services and ultimately building a platform for multiple product conditions. Uh, we went through a period of um, the deployment of technologies like AI, including AI. Um, this is, of course, before LLMs were really widely used, and so it was a number of other AI technologies. And then finally, we scaled that business, um, ultimately, uh, in order to, to go public, as you can imagine, we had very predictable uh, revenue growth, um, focused mostly on commercial payers, so um, employers uh, being the largest market that we served. And uh, I'm happy to talk about all of you above. Excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, I'm Jim Perry, nice to meet you all. Um, I am not an MIT alum. Um, I know you're supposed to go in rooms where you're not the smartest person in the room. Um, I think I might have overdone it on this one. Um, so my background is uh, I, was, I went to UCLA undergrad, UCSD for med school. Um, I taught briefly uh, before I went to med school um, in Southeast Arkansas, so a little bit of a rural bent as well. Um, and then, you know, since then, um, briefly, I did my uh, internship in internal medicine before deciding that I kind of wanted to see where there were areas to go and explore um, how to have a larger impact across the healthcare system, um, taking my clinical knowledge and kind of applying it more broadly. Um, and so I, I uh, went ahead and went to McKinsey for a few years with the intention of just understanding the system a little bit more holistically. Um, I find that there's a lot of times where people understand they come up through one vertical of the healthcare system, but they haven't actually seen the whole spectrum of it. So that was a nice training ground to be able to get a better sense of how everything is set up from an incentive perspective, how people think in different places, um, how strategies are formulated. Um, from there, I briefly ran a hospital with the idea that I was gonna be able to take them and go at risk and build out an integrated delivery system. Um, turned out that it was gonna be focused a bit more on doing a hospital turnaround. So ultimately came back up to the Bay with uh, my wife and she was very glad to move back. Um, and went to a, um, an early stage company called Vita Health. Um, when they were transitioning from being more of a direct consumer to more of a B2B to C sort of an approach. Um, was able to build out a lot of their first clinical programs there, um, pivoted kind of the company towards more of an evidence-based uh, approach and um, really trying to solve for that intersection of engagement and safety and efficacy um, and really being able to show real, really true value um, for, for users and for the folks who are paying for it on the other side from uh, self-insured employers. Um, after that, went to um, Apple um, to work with some 
ex-colleagues of mine, uh, again, um, uh, from McKinsey who had gone there. Um, got to ship uh, some payer-facing products that were good partnerships there. Um, and then ha actually had the opportunity to jump uh, over to a new um, incubator within Anthem, um, based on one of my friends from Apple. Um, got to uh, be the first class of EIRs there, define kind of this early stage product with the data science team, um, and then COVID hit. And so ultimately just had the opportunity to go on there, actually built it out, and then since then I've, I've moved on from building out the data science product team um, to then moving over into more of the digital care delivery side, um, where we're building a lot of products that are meant to kind of solve for that intersection of creating trust with members and users and patients um, to help them actually get to the right outcomes in ways that they actually care about. Um, and that, uh, that help move the needle from a, from a financial standpoint as well as a health outcome standpoint. So I'm um, super interested in kind of these intersections between you know, different places, we were talking about this before, um, about where you know, there's, more, there's more places where people need to be cross-functional and understand kind of everything from the product side to the business side to the you know, user experience side to the way that the system is actually built and works. Um, so I've tried to kind of cobble together a bunch of experiences across that, um, and uh, yeah, very uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting. Me. Um, hi everyone. My name is Jodina Sockley. Um, I graduated MIT in 2007 in Core Seven, um, and I think science um, is, is this choppy or no, we good? Okay. Um, I think science at Included Health. We're a company that, sure. Is this one better? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I lead data science at Included Health. Um, where we're trying to kind of bring um, complete patient care into one centralized place. So imagine um, we're the phone number on the back of an insurance card. You start with you know your logistic billing coverage type of questions. But moving forward, you know, you might need to find in-person care. Who is the highest provide, uh, quality provider that you should go to? Um, moving forward, you might need an expert second opinion. So how do we get that for you? Um, and kind of all the way into us actually being a practice of medicine. Um, so we have a virtual practice in primary care, behavioral health, um, urgent care, and chronic um, disease management. Um, so really trying to be end to end in that. Um, and my role, my role is figuring out how, kind of through that whole journey, um, we're able to bring personalization and automation through to enhance um, clinical outcomes for all of our members and the member experience. Um, so I've been at Included Health for the past nine years. Um, prior to that, um, I was an academic. Um, so I did my PhD and postdoc in computational simulations of living systems. Um, We'd actually built you know, the world's first model of a cell that included every single um, gene function, molecular interaction. I actually really enjoyed that work. Um, but the path to get to actual human impact was really slow, right? I felt like I was sitting in the slow lane to get, um, get there, and that's why I've gotten into the field in the first place. Um, so when I found out about um, um, Included Health, it offered a way for um, me to use a lot of the same skills that I had built up um, in the academic track, but apply it more readily towards kind of actually being able to help uh, patients get high quality care. Um, and it's totally played out to be true. That's why I've been there for nine years. We get to hear stories from our team that's on the phone with the members constantly. And I do the trace back to see like, you know, where did data fit in that story? Um, and, and it's those stories that, that are my fuel and kind of why I'm in this space. So I should probably introduce myself as well, and um, oh, yeah, the camera. I should probably give a little bit about my background as well. So I'm a um, PhD in course two, 2002. I actually did my PhD thesis in modeling um, human systems as well, not the cell. I was modeling at the organ level, and I was looking at um, interaction between fluid mechanics and um, um, cells um, for atherosclerosis development in the chronic bifurcation. Same, same as uh, Jayadita, I found that. By the time you know this actually has a, an impact on patients, it's going to take uh, a long, long time. Um, I joined GE after that for ten years. Uh, I kept moving around the globe, so I had the chance to see different health systems in different countries and how they they ran. 
I moved back to the U.S. in um, 20, late 2014 with Phillips Hospital at home, where I started, and that's when I started working on chronic disease management and actually managing patients um, outside the hospital. And I introduced uh, four uh, programs that were uh, initially outside the U.S., and then I worked on a program in the U.S., but it was uh, quite interesting. I worked on a maternal health product in Indonesia to equip midwives to actually recognize um, high-risk pregnancies. I worked on a stroke therapy platform in China to uh, enable stroke therapy at home and outside the, the hospital as well. And um, a, a respiratory therapy uh, program in India, where we actually had, uh, and all of these had a service component, a software component, and, and a hardware component as well. And then I moved back to the US, I was hospital to home in Phillips, where we had a, a program of critical heart failure. And uh, since then, I actually joined a number of startups. Um, I won't get into the, the details of them now. But, um, one of the things that we noticed, and uh, my co-founder at Verbal, he was running also a remote patient monitoring uh, company, and we noticed that quality assurance has been something that was really, we're doing it the same way that we're doing it since 50 years, right? So when we started looking at how we want to make sure, like everybody was looking at the patient, and I think digital health companies have done a phenomenal job in actually providing patient solutions, and the patient experience has improved very much so since the Longo was launched until today. Um, there's been leaps in there. But uh, who's looking at the health coach or the provider? And we wanted to take a deeper look at that because we wanted to ensure that the quality of the interaction between the provider and the patient was actually something that can be improved upon and can be measured. And you know, with an MIT background, you can't really improve what you can't measure. So we started measuring that, and that's how Verbal was born. We, uh, we actually listen to all the conversations without listening to any one of them, and we give real-time nudges to uh, health coaches and providers to, hey, don't forget to say this, don't forget to do that. And uh, at the end of the time, we, at the end of the, um, at the actual call, we can actually tell them, hey, this is your adherence to best practices, you could have done this better, you could have done that better. And that enables us to actually have a very high quality of telehealth interaction versus without verbal. So that's how verbal was born, and uh, we've been at it now for 14 months. We've signed up seven customers, um, five more on the way, and um, it's looking good, it's looking promising. It's, uh, I'll, I'll share my own experiences with scaling a digital health company uh, later in the talk. So. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, I think I want to start with you, Omar, because, um, you know, it's just the Livongo story, the Telex story. You know, we've never seen an, an exit that big, right? Um, um, and then, yet after that, you still wanted to stay in digital health. And, you know, I want to know what, what inspired you to start Homeward and, and why now? And what differentiates it from other digital health solutions? So um, as, as I wrapped up my time at, at Teladoc, uh, you know, we had integrated the two companies. So Lavongo I mentioned is a, a company that was focused on chronic condition management. We started with diabetes, we expanded to include hypertension, heart failure, mental health conditions, really all in one, uh, essentially one intertwined experience, recognizing that people with, who are living with chronic conditions are often not living with just one. And so, Rather than break these things up into silos, you know, here's a, a wonderful opportunity to flip the model, focus on the experience of the patient, and then design all the components that are gonna be required in order to make that person's life easier to live with the conditions that they're managing. Um, Teladoc, on the other hand, was focused on the practice of medicine. And as the largest telemedicine platform was doing this, uh, you know, at a, at a large scale, although typically focused on urgent care, as the types of use cases that they encountered. So think, runny noses, you know, coughs and sore throats and uh, eye infections. And, you know, generally speaking, things that were very transactional in nature. You know, if a parent would call with a sick kid, they'd be able to have a video consultation with a teledoc doctor. And um, most likely, that was the extent of the relationship that they formed. So here was this opportunity, at least on paper, to bring these ideas together. You know, this, this ability to, to focus on the member's experience in their daily life, and now connect that with a doctor who could be anywhere and is available instantly. And connect that doctor not just to the, to the person, the, the patient, but also to the data. And in real time have access to things like blood sugars and blood pressure data and so forth. Um, that that uh, concepts what brought the companies together. And I think, you know, as with any large scale merger, uh, it's gonna go through its, its sort of gestation period and I'm hopeful that over some period of time we start to see the fruits of that that combination. Um, but uh, actually to answer your question, you know, why did I sort of get back into something new? My time at Livongo and Teladoc, I think more than anything, educated me on 
where are some of the big outstanding problems were still remaining? You know, what were the things that um, perhaps we would be able to solve over time at a, at a company like Livongo, but um, really needed a fresh look. And uh, what I found very compelling uh, was um, areas where we could really align incentives between patients, providers, and payers. And it sounds really trivial and sort of trite to say, you know, of course everyone's aiming for that, you know, double, triple, quadruple aim sort of thing. Um, but but I, was, I was reaching, I think, a moment of sort of optimism that this is a particularly good time to do that. And part of the reason is, is because of technology and the pace of digital technology and the affordability of modules of technology that are going to increase time to market. So I think we're all living in a wonderful time to be building digital health products because we don't have to do it all from scratch. Uh, number two, there's an acceptance in the broader market for value-based care models, which, which really starts to move outside of a a fee-for-service world that we all you know, live in today for the most part, where providers get paid for delivering a certain volume of service, and instead shifts that to a model where providers get paid for the value that they deliver in the form of outcomes. And that's one, you know, we can all get behind that idea as patients, right? We all wanna know that our doctor is doing everything they can to make us healthier and that they're financially motivated as much as they are you know, morally and ethically motivated, which they all are. So this emergence of value-based care models and the phase of the market that we're in was something very exciting to me. And then the third reason for why uh, I, I decided to sort of get back into the into the arena, to use the current um, phrase, um, is uh, is I was still very motivated by, by by seeing the extent of health disparities that we encounter, even today. You know, even even with like the most expensive healthcare system in the world, you know, we're doing a pretty terrible job of distributing healthcare capacity equitably across our own population. So uh, as I went learning about different segments of the market, different subpopulations. I was pretty shocked, frankly, to understand that 60 million Americans uh, are receiving care that is resulting in roughly 20% higher mortality. That's a shocking figure. It's, this is 20% this is of Americans, and they are dying much faster than their urban and suburban counterparts. And uh, when you start to peel down the onion and understand why, some of it's access and capacity, so there's about half as many primary care doctors, there's about eight as many specialists, so that explains some of it, but that's no excuse. You know, one, we, we can't, you know, just blame it on, on a supply shortage and resign ourselves to that fact, and two, um, there's actually many other reasons that also factor in to why these populations have continued to be underserved, and it's a, sort of a perennial phenomenon, despite the fact that there's bipartisan support, you know, for rural health care to improve, there just hasn't been much happening. And so those are the three factors. You know, really, this is kind of more a statement about it's the problem statement that got me very excited about getting back in to building in healthcare. And uh, and so Homeward was founded with that with that idea, with that or you know. So the origin story is let's focus entirely on solving this problem for this group of people, this enormous segment of the population that's never really been designed for, at least not at a systematic level, where we can take a step back and ask ourselves, what are all the things that need to be true? in order for us to bridge the gap and improve uh, the quality of healthcare. That's terrific. Go ahead. So Jim, you've got to say hi. You, you, you have a long career in healthcare. Um, you're a medical doctor, you worked at Apple, Vita, and now for Elevance. You've continued this focus on chronic care. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? Um, maybe also about the Edna Apple experience? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, Apple Atmos experience is a little bit separate from kind of the chronic condition side. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, chronic uh, chronic condition management is something that they're they're just it's something where most physicians are not really trained to go after and measure this really robustly. I think in a lot of their clinical practice. Um, and they often don't have the tools to do it either. So this is all, I think, changing, sort of to Tamar's point, right? There's a lot of opportunity within that space, and there's a lot of interest in that space, but it doesn't really exist well for a lot of these things to be codified. I mean, if you look at, like, the diabetes prevention program, I mean, that was originally from a paper in, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, and work that was done in that time, and it took until a moderate really popularized it to make it something that more people were actually getting access to on a regular cadence. And even then, it was fairly, you know, consistent with the original way the paper was written. Um, so, you know, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity to really start to understand the different ways in which you can actually effectively meet people where they are and, and engage with them on the topics that they're most interested in, in terms of like 
relating to the, the areas of their lives that are impacted by their conditions, um, and then helping them understand what concrete changes they can make um, in those spaces, and then using tech to really make this much more widely available at a, at a better price point. And I think these are, these are critical aspects that you know, are, they all kind of line up with the opportunities within tech in particular. Um, and so I think chronic condition management is something that kind of underpins a lot of the opportunities within the healthcare space generally. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're, I, I'm often thinking about in the background whenever we're looking at any sort of engagement approach that we're using. Um, are we actually going to be able to impact any of these key metrics against any of these major conditions? Because the burden of these diseases is so high um, that it's, a, it's, a, it's an important area to make sure that you keep an eye on and that you're actually measuring progress against. Um, also to Amar's point, I think there's the reality that there is a massive disparity in the way that people are managed in these conditions um, in different uh, populations in this country. And so there's a lot of opportunity that you can uh, bring technology to bear to help make it so that that's better uh, distributed and more widely available. So actually one of the studies that is actually a combination between um, Anthem slash Elevance, um, Apple, and um, a few others, there's work that we've got the, uh, the abstract published, I think, for kind of the protocol for it. Um, we have some promising things showing up with the asthma digital study where we're actually looking across a couple of different population groups, um, both on the commercial and the Medicaid side. Um, and there are some promising outcomes that I think we're seeing there. So I think there's, there's these signals that you can start to generate, and then the question becomes how do you actually build that into the right models to make it so that it's more widely available and more widespread. Um, so in terms of the Apple uh, work that I did with um, Aetna, um, that followed a lot of the more chronic condition management work that I was doing at Vida. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that was the, the initial hypothesis that we were going with was how much do you use incentives to help drive engagement? How much do you use it to drive behavior change? Um, and I think incentives are a very tricky thing to play with um, in the sense that you don't want to reduce people's intrinsic motivation. Um, you wanna make sure that they still have uh, the interest, the you know motivation, the agency to continue to move forward in areas that really these are lifestyle changes that need to be perpetuated throughout their lives that you're trying to create, um, and the more that you tie them to specific incentives, the riskier it becomes that you're gonna be able to have that perpetual use over time. Um, so I think you know there were, there were definitely some great findings that we had in terms of showing good outcomes, good engagement. Um, we showed a lot of, I think, you know, a positive ROI and some, um, uh, some cost savings as, as part of that product, and it was, it was I think, very interesting. Um, there's some papers in JMIR and other places around some of this. Um, so it's all public, um, but I think you know, it's it's an area that you know I continue to look at and explore in ways for how do you get somebody into a product as the first maybe buy, and then you figure out how you expand from there in a way that doesn't leverage them too much. Um, it's sort of like how do you get the first attention, and then how do you find the things that actually matter to them so that you provide and deliver value on the things that are core to that user and that patient. And then from there, you gain license, I think, to start to actually work with them on things that are more important to their overall health. But you have to start with the things that matter to them, and sometimes you have to just get their attention in the first place. And so that becomes kind of really that key early mechanism that, that's sort of our hypothesis right now that we're working towards. Fabulous, okay. Um, I guess we only have one mic, so I'll just hand it over to Jadita. Jadita, I, um, I've been following uh, Grand Rounds before it became Exclusive Health for a while, um, and I thought the value proposition was pretty intriguing. And I'm not sure everybody here realizes what that value proposition was. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that. And then I'm curious about the merger. Um, what triggered that? And um, you know, how has your, your experience been since then? And it must have been really good because you've been there for nine years. I don't know anybody. I, I, mean, I bet you there's probably maybe two people in this room that's been in one company for nine years. So I'd love to hear about that and also about your, um, your 30 under 40 award. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, so starting with Grand Rounds. Um, so um, I kind of think of it this way. Healthcare is a basic human right, right? But at those kind of highest moments of need for yourself or for your family member, the system doesn't quite kind of serve you right, right? You don't really know where to start. 
you don't know what type of care you need or which doctor to go to, if that doctor is actually gonna give you the right diagnosis and treatment plan. You don't know how much it's gonna cost. And so kind of at these most stressful moments in time, like you're faced with just confusion, right? So, and then if you think about how things have moved in literally every other industry, right? I can take something out of my pocket and get from point A to point B. I can trust that it will recommend the right TV show for me, um, et cetera. But something that's just so fundamental to what we all need is just not there yet, right? So the premise of Grand Rounds was to figure out how to kind of make that as kind of intuitive, informed, empowering of a process so that the patient can feel like they're in control. They feel like they can actually navigate through the healthcare system with some degree of confidence that they're getting themselves or their family member to the right care. Um, and so it's been, so the term that we use is that Grand Rounds is a navigator um, in healthcare, which means kind of hold your hand through the whole system, be it the really basic needs, like I don't understand how much something's gonna cost me or whether something's covered by my plan, to okay, which doctor should I go to, what types of questions should I be asking that provider, what should I be doing in parallel, um, should I be getting second opinions, um, and then getting to the second question. Our ultimate goal was eventually to get into the practice of medicine, because what that would do is really give us the ability to go end to end on the member's journey and really be able to assist through the, the whole thing. Um, so around that time, we found Doctor On Demand, um, which it was, really lucky, they had a really, really similar uh, mission and vision, but they started on the opposite end, right? So they started by building out the practice of medicine, they had already built out a urgent care, um, virtual care delivery system, and they were getting going on their primary care and their mental health um, virtual care practice, um, and they wanted to go in this direction towards kind of the rest of the integration. Um, and so it was a pretty, um, a pretty good marriage, right? Where two really similar sized companies were able to come together and basically get to that goal faster for both companies. Um, the other really fortunate thing that happened was that this merger happened right around the time of the pandemic when virtual care just became a necessity for society. Um, so to be able to have that practice right where the world needed it was just something that was really, really fortunate um, for us. Um, in terms of why have I stayed for nine years, um, I think there's, there's two main things, right? So as I was talking about earlier, the first and kind of foremost thing is the impact to the members. Um, being able to have kind of a pretty steady feedback loop of what we're doing is making a difference in terms of clinical outcomes, um, out-of-pocket healthcare savings, et cetera, and making a difference in their lives. The second is opportunity. Right, um, going back to what I was saying before, this is maybe one of the last industries to really have been inflected by data and technology. Um, and there's definitely something there, right? Something that's gonna help um, make this system less painful for those having to go, everybody who has to go through it, right? Um, and essentially create this feeling of I'm empowered to know that I'm getting the right care, the highest quality care regardless of where you live, you know, be it rural, population, urban, et cetera, everyone should have that feeling of, I know I'm getting the right thing for, for my health. Um, and so I think the opportunity is high, and I found that like, we have a great team of people who really are driven behind that challenge, um, and it's just a fun environment to be in. All right, last question. Of course, we want to hear about it. Uh, thank you for embarrassing me on that one. Um, <laughs> You know, there's, I mean, if you look across this room, I'm sure like there's so many things going on and all of it requires, like if you're really working in this space, I think it does deserve the recognition. I don't think there's anything special there. What's been nice for us is that it gave a little bit of limelight to kind of, there is this promise of bringing AI personalization automation to the healthcare space. Um, you know, let's get like more and more people thinking in this area um, and trying to solve kind of a lot of the challenges that have not been solved yet. So I think if the article kind of inspires even one person to get in the space and kind of get their hands dirty, it, it, it's, it's worth it. Oh, great. Uh, you, yeah. <laughs> so I think um, I want to shift to, uh, uh, to really a little bit about the products and platforms that you built. And um, you know, what are the learnings and what challenges do we have to keep in mind when designing a digital health product? Uh, I can tell you that from personal experience, right? So um, 
but giving an iPad that you're five year old is not going to serve sick or older users, right? So, how do you address usability specifically for older, chronically Ill, Ill patients? And Amar, in your case, um, how's that further impacted or compounded for rural? Yeah, so some of the um, analogies I like are, are just the most sort of general question of how to design for austere environments. So, you know, when, when a, a particular environment is resource constrained, um, that does end up, you know, being a forcing function. Designers actually love constraints, right? As I'm sure a lot of you, you know, as designers or, or engineers or product people appreciate. Um, but, uh, but it really does, it does force you to really refine, you know, your product and, and the experience to its essence. What is the actual thing you're trying to do? What's the, the leanest possible way you can, you can get that mission accomplished? Um, uh, I'll give you a concrete example of what we did at Livongo as we were building that product and service um, in the early days. So uh, Livongo started out with this idea that people with diabetes, um, a typical experience for someone with diabetes is to have a, a blood sugar monitor. Uh, they will prick their finger. They will uh, test you know, and get a number back on that monitor. Number somewhere between 30 and 300, um, and and they're supposed to do something with that information. Their you know the expectation is that they're trained on what that means, that they know how to make changes to their behavior in order to respond to what they just received, and um, and that over a longer period of time, you know that data could be of use to a doctor who would review it in theory and then use that as a basis to make treatment decisions. For example, adjusting your medication. So that, that was the current paradigm, the, the, the paradigm we were entering, you know, as, as Lavanga was just getting off the ground. What we saw was, when you really start to break down the problem, um, a lot of the, the dead ends that had already been sort of experienced by companies trying to attack the problem um, made the assumption that, one, that the patient wanted more data or more um, things they could do with the data, that they would somehow, if they had an app, the data was in an app, that they'd, they'd be you know, able to manage their diabetes more easily or better. Uh, there's also an assumption that the doctor wanted an app or wanted to see the data coming off of this thing, you know, in real time, uh, because they were just, you know, waiting anxiously by their EHR to see a number pop up so they could go do something. So there's, you know, I think some, um, you know, you know, candidly, kind of like outsider impressions of how the reality for these these patients and providers was actually manifesting. Um, it was one of the, I think, strong suits of Livongo to make sure that, that we really form these very strong dyads between our product people and our clinical people. Like they sat in the same room, they worked on the problem together, they really made sure that we understood what exactly the patient was feeling and experiencing. In fact, many of our employees at, at Livongo had themselves had diabetes. So something like, there was a period of time when 30% of, of the team you know, was living with diabetes themselves. So we, we're really very intently focused on understanding that, that journey that people are experiencing. And where we spent a lot of time was mapping out the hassles. You know, so unlike a lot of industries where you're trying to create delight, and you're trying to create these sort of positive feedback loops around things that people already want to do, here's the inverse. Here's a situation where people have to do something that they hate to do. And now how do you try to create a, a world in which they, are, they hate it less, right? And they'll do it more. And so, um, so that really, that kind of, really allowed us to focus on, on a very different approach to solving the problem. Ultimately, we found was that the, the bigger win here was not gonna be to delight, you know, with like animations and like, you did it, you know, high fives. It was more about stripping out friction and stripping out a lot of the negative aspects that people experienced. Um, we decided, for example, not to have a mobile app at all at launch. So our device was extremely leaned out. It was just a blood glucose monitor with a cellular connection, the data went to our cloud, it came back with a message, you received the message right on the monitor, it was like a, it was like a Twitter message, like 140 characters, and you had to say something meaningful uh, in that 140 characters that would hopefully change behavior and then promote ongoing you know, sort of sustenance of that changed behavior. So, um, so these were a good example of the kinds of constraints we applied, and, and we tested constantly to make sure that our, our user base um, was actually being impacted by it. Uh, this is the, the world that JV was talking about where you know, this doesn't happen often that you get to instrument things in healthcare. So here was the first kind of opportunity to have a round trip, basically a real, real time round trip of data on an action that a person took, which is check their blood sugar, the data itself, which is a value, a you know, clinical algorithm on our back end that said, here's what that number means, returning information to that, that patient that they can act on. You know, your numbers are running 
high, drink some water, and then they'll start to come down. Or your numbers are running very low, you know, eat some, eat some sugar. Here's three ways to get sugar that are really easy and convenient. Like those sorts of tips are actually clinically meaningful. What's really important is getting it back in real time and making it bite-sized to suit this very broad audience of people. Um, and that includes older adults, it includes, but I mean, fundamentally, I think what we learned was uh, it actually was a very broad-based approach that if we were designing for that lowest common denominator, make this easy for everybody, it also becomes adoptable for everybody. We're not really excluding people on the basis of its complexity or you know, really tuning it up for an audience that was going to limit the potential for impact. So before you leave that, were there any design considerations that you specifically took into account for rural populations? Yeah, so you know, we had a cellular connection, as I mentioned, and the reason, one of the big reasons for that was uh, the complexity for any, any, frankly, any consumer to set up, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll sort of talk about the, the status quo. There were devices on the market for blood glucose monitoring that included a Bluetooth connection. And, um, you know, 10 years ago, and frankly, even now, you know, Bluetooth can be finicky and certainly, you know, difficult to configure. So if you're an older adult, it's a, it's a tough proposition. If you're a rural um, uh, community member, uh, you actually, like having Bluetooth actually doesn't get you very far because then you don't have broadband sitting behind it. So if you don't have broadband, um, it kind of doesn't matter whether you paired your device to your, your phone <laughs> if you're not able to connect to the internet. And so, uh, so we, made, we made sure that we were using cellular networks. And in fact, we were running off of initially 2G networks, which are extremely, you know, covering, like well, well you know, with great coverage, even in these rural areas, because super low bandwidth, super mature networks. Over time, we upgraded to 3G and then ultimately 4G, but really, we could sort of make sure that we were optimizing first and foremost for coverage, which is also possible, again, because we were so, so uh, uh, light with our touch when it came to the volume of data in the experience. We were just being extremely parsimonious about what was the critical amount of information that needed to move to us and back in order to have the kind of impact we're trying to have. So that gave us a lot of ability to extend the reach and work at the frontier. So we had folks from really pretty much every rural community in America, rural Maine, I mean, it was pretty astounding um, that we could connect these folks who were otherwise were really isolated and really <coughs> manage these conditions pretty much on their own. Great. Jim, do you want to give us an, an example? Uh, sure. I think, you know, um, a lot of what we talked about resonates. Um, I'll, I'll just follow up with very sh uh, short, small versions of my own sort of experiences that are not the same as that, but are, you know, maybe additive in some small way. Um, I think, you know, a few things that we've noticed are that folks who are chronically ill and older, they actually do use tech at fairly high rates. It's just they're using it for different things. So they'll go through the process of trying to understand how to get to whatever endpoints they're trying to hit, whether it's their email or whether it's getting onto Facebook or whatever else. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be interested in doing the extra work for something that reminds them that they're sick. Right. Um, so I think that's one really important thing to consider. I think the other thing is, you know, as much, and I think you said this really well, like as much as everybody in this room loves data, 99% of the population hates it. It <laughs> reminds them of math, right? Um, and nobody liked their math school or their math classes in school, right? For, most, for the most part. Um, I know having taught math, um, except people in this room, um, having taught math, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's challenging, right, for a lot of folks. Um, and so I think the more that you, as, as you design things, you have to keep in mind the way that people actually will interact with them and the things that they actually care about. And it's, it's not necessarily native to a lot of the types of problems that you guys like to try to solve in the first place, right? Um, it's not about like the cellular network problem so much as it is a how does this person interact with these things right now? So um, the example I'll give is where you know we were doing some user research, uh, really actually more on the provider side, um, in some of the care clinics clinics um, about a year ago. Um, and when I was in the clinic, I was waiting to meet up with some of the NPs in the back. Um, and I sat out in the waiting room, and I just talked with one or two of the folks who were sitting in the waiting room. And I was like, tell me a little bit about yourself. How are things going? Um, tell me a little bit about what you're here for. Hey, by the way, pull out your phone. I'm, I'm sort of curious, like, what do you use on there for your health? And how does it work? And, you know, both of the interactions were actually pretty much the same. They pulled out their phone. I was like, show me the app that you use for getting in touch with Caremore or for managing your health care generally. And they go to their phone dialer and they go and they use.
use the caller ID, so they're searching under their recent calls to find the caller ID that says Care More. That's their app. So the complexity of anything, I mean, your point about Bluetooth is a good one, but like the complexity of anything in this space is enough to put people off of it because they don't natively want to interact with it. Um, and you really have to sell them on why it's relevant for them. And so that's where I think, you know, some of the conversation up here has been a little bit about this pivot towards there's real value with those um, interactions between physicians or providers and their patients and really figuring out how to have that be the place where you really actually can have the rubber meet the road on a lot of changes. Um, because if you think about like a place like Caremore, that's where you can actually train people on how to use these things and also assess for them why they're interested in making these changes. Is it because they want to be able to be around for their grandkids to graduate from high school? Is it because they want to be able to play with their kids without getting tired? Is it because you know they don't want to feel crappy at the end of a long day, right? What are their motivations and how do you tie that back to, okay, what are you doing now about that and then how do we simplify that for you and making it all low friction. Um, and that low friction piece, I'll just dovetail on one, one more thing you were talking about because there's a lot of, especially early on I think with health tech, there was a lot of an emphasis on how can we make this cute to be kind of engaging. Um, and I think to your point, most people don't really want that. They want low friction. So I think we found a lot of success with the product that you know, uh, we put together um, when I first joined uh, Anthem, where the entire intent of it was to predict who was likely to need one of these high value procedures, help them before they even have their first consult with the doc, um, know that they can shop different procedures and help them find the best possible match for them, for a physician and a surgeon, um, or a, I'm sorry, a surgeon and a facility pair um, based on their particular profile. And then being able to actually, you know, get them the right message through the right channels to get them engaged. And the entire thing was designed to be low friction, like one, two clicks before you're actually in. So we pre-registered everybody, even though they didn't already have accounts. We had like all this different work that we had done on the back end to make it so that it was much more of a one and done experience for them. And as a result of that, they had far higher engagement rates with this than they typically did, right? And also it was built around the idea of, hey, we don't know exactly what's going on with you, but did you know you have this benefit? And here's three different procedure examples that you know you can shop in this benefit. And we know that one of those is maybe a higher probability for you, but we're not telling you that that's why you should come in, right? It's more just making the information available at the right points in time and hoping that you can move them forward with as little friction and as much value as possible at every single step. And so, so what was the interface that you were interacting with? Is it mainly an SMS and voice? So it was mostly through email that we had to do it through. Um, we actually couldn't even do a lot of the SMS stuff just based on some of the do not call work and everything. Wow. Um, so there's there were a lot of restrictions that both internally and externally were sort of put on the product. And they have to click on something and then that email would open up the web page where they have to log in? Or yep, and it was a simple thing where they would set name and password or confirm date of birth and set a password and then they'd be in. And then they were registered for all the other experiences. But typically the way that it would work was if you wanted somebody to be able to do that, in most cases, they, would, they wouldn't be able to be pre-registered and they would get forced through this health risk assessment. Like, tell me 40 questions about things that you don't want to talk about with me. And then at the end of it, by the way, I'm just gonna dump you into the generic experience. I'm not even gonna land you on the right page, right? Like, this is the sort of crap that is kind of the standard in a lot of ways. Well, so there's, there's a low bar to move off of, but I think there's a lot of intentionality that if you start from the beginning and you say, I'm going to strip out things as much as possible and also I'm gonna understand what their baseline is, and what they're interested in, you can make a lot more headway. Terrific. So, Jagita, what are you uh, sharing with us about the delightful patient experience as well? Yeah, um, specifically about accessibility or experience? Well, just how to remove some of these obstacles that are engaging chronically ill, older, older patients, specifically also newer patients, if you have examples, because yeah. that's an underserved population. Yeah, I'm going to take an approach, but maybe a few micro, micro stories of how we handle it, maybe even going from micro to macro. Um, it starts with the design, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel there. There's a ton of research out there now on like how do you think about the fonts and the sizes, the size of the buttons, et cetera, to like actually design in a more accessible way. Second, I think, is making sure that we're able to support kind of a multi-channel way of accessing the system, right? There are just people, like I think even today, our highest volumes come in through the phone rather than through chat or video, et cetera. So making sure that we have all those options um, based on how different people want to interact with the system. Um, another example is we've been working a lot recently on trying to figure out if we can almost predict 
um, whether a person is going to do better in the system through in-person interactions or virtual interactions, because it really does depend kind of on the demographics, the age, et cetera. Um, so kind of studying their past behavior, what's been the nature of in-person relationships they have had in the past to kind of figure out um, which route is going to be more productive for them as a member, um, and then catering the experience down that line to make sure their journey kind of matches what is going to work best for them. Um, and then from like just the data standpoint, there's almost like this ethical piece that goes into it also. So a lot of our data validation or model validation um, also has to kind of check for a lot of social determinants of health or demographic um, kind of nuance that the model results themselves might be causing, right? So if we built some models that try to rank providers for members, um, that surface for that member with the highest quality options for them would be up top. And then we study conversion patterns to um, how many of our members are actually going to those top suggestions. Kind of how does that look if you're comparing different groups? Is there something where kind of the model results are making it harder, let's say, for the older population to kind of get to those results, et cetera? Um, and making sure that we're not causing kind of inherent biases in terms of what we're pointing out. Um, and I think at the kind of most macro level, it is also thinking about. Like, I mean, it sucks. The world isn't fair today. Like, access isn't equal today. I mean, that's the whole premise of what Omar is doing, right? So, given that, what can we do to make it better, right? So, you know, we see that in the older population, they're having a hard time getting to their appointments. So, we try to partnership with Uber to see for, like, you know, if someone really has that need, can we just get them to their appointment? Um, there, we have a communities. Um, effort going on right now where we know that access to care in the LGBTQ plus or the black community is, is harder, right? But there are ways for us to figure out who the better affirming providers are, those that would kind of treat that population at a higher quality bar. Okay, how do we get um, members of those communities to those providers that are going to kind of give them a higher quality of care? So it's also kind of saying, okay, what does the world look like today? And so, and what can we do within that um, kind of the constructs of that to help get people to to better care. You remind me of one quick thing, which okay. was um, the the phone. We actually did have outbound phone calls for a few of our folks, but mostly there was also a call center that was dedicated to that that worked for um, once the email campaigns would go out, people could call in and they could actually just talk with someone through what their options might be. And it's, I mean, I think people forget about some of these things being really powerful ways of actually broadening the access and the use of these types of solutions, right? And you have to just make sure that you have the same consistency of information on the back end, then you can map and see who's been using which pieces, but everything else, yeah. Absolutely. All right, so yeah, I think we've got about uh, another 25 minutes here before we can start taking Q&A, and &A. I wanted to make sure we got, we talked about product market fit and product design, and I took away from that that uh, less is more, especially for this uh, patient population that we're targeting. But uh, let's let's talk about AI and AI interactions in, in healthcare. Um, which interactions are most most amenable to, uh, to AI? And maybe just illustrate a few examples, like give us a few examples where AI has definitely improved the patient experience. So um, some of the places where we found that there's a partition that's worth really, really defining when it comes to deploying AI in healthcare is the extent that you need explainability and really, you know, fundamentally like traceability of, of the origin of whatever the recommendation is that you're, you're, you're sort of trying to act on. And so uh, in, in general, what we've, what we've done is sort of really partition the domains and, and define, you know, here's an area, for example, member engagement is a great example of a domain where in many cases you don't necessarily need to know uh, what the basis is for what an algorithm outputs. In, if you're um, running that domain with a goal that's non-clinical, for example, I'd like this person to try this new feature, um, there's a, your hands are free, pretty much. You know, there's a lot you can do and you can work you know, with, generally speaking, the, the latest generations of black box technologies in order to do that kind of optimization work. You can, you can you know, run kind of like large scale experiments and, um, and let your, you know, your winners sort of uh, continue to, to, to run and so forth. 
So um, at Livongo, we, we made pretty liberal use of this. You know, that was one domain where we, we pretty much let our data science teams run wild in terms of the, the kinds of models that they could work with. Um, and this is in sort of very stark contrast to anything clinical. You know, so we, we spent a lot of time on really defining where to draw this line, you know, what truly constitutes something that starts to introduce, you know, even the slightest whiff of a safety or efficacy consideration. And if there was any possible um, consequence that had a, a bearing on safety or efficacy, we, we, you know, sort of basically moved it over into a, into a category that required any kind of algorithmic work that we did to be very transparent. And so um, examples there, um, there are still plenty of you know, opportunities to use AI, um, mostly again for the purpose of optimization. But uh, a lot of that work was, was really kind of then focused on places where uh, we would take an established clinical algorithm, you know, that's evidence-based, that would stay at the core of what we were, we were building around. And, uh, and then we were, we were really using that so the clinical algorithm as the basis with which we'd optimize other algorithms we run on top or alongside. And so an example um, is as we were identifying, uh, for example, uh, uh, from clinical trends, we were you know, extrapolating the likelihoods. Uh, let's just take, for example, in the case of diabetes data, you know, if we saw problematic trends um, regarding low blood sugars at night, you know, we would have enough information there to, to glean something that suggested that we probably need to make some kind of intervention, you know, in the late afternoon that reminded a person that, you know, they have a pattern of the following kind. And so, again, very explainable, very traceable, um, things that, you know, I'd, I'd call it, you know, lighter AI, right, relative to the kinds of technology that we build ourselves now, um, but frankly, very impactful from a clinical perspective and also very testable and uh, in a way that you can really demonstrate that what you're doing is safe, is effective, and can be applied um, in a way that's going to drive outcomes. I think as we take this idea and sort of you know look at what's happening today uh, in the deployment of LLMs, I am um, frankly a little bit nervous because I think there is uh, not as clear a recognition that um, that this idea of that, that LLMs are frankly you know fundamentally a black box in, in our understanding of of um, the logic or lack of logic that's underlying a lot of the recommendations that come from it. I think there's a, you know, in many cases, and, and I'm no one in this room, but there are people, you know, in our industry who think that because an LLM, you know, talks like a human, that it thinks like a human, and they don't appreciate the fact that there is not actually a mechanistic model, you know, underlying it. There's not a clinical model. Um, it is a language model, and therefore, you know, it's 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 not reasoning. And with a lot of the clinical problems we're you know, working on, they require reasoning. They require a very deep understanding of the underlying clinical models and, and phenomena. Um, so, you know, I think I think what I anticipate is we'll see a lot of usage of sort of, you know, direct incorporation of LLMs into, uh, call it the consumer journey, the non-clinical consumer journey that we all experience. You know, how do you like figure out how to get your, your you know, um, your bill paid with your health plan, you know, Hopefully that becomes a less shitty experience than it is today, right? Where you can actually understand what's in your exposure benefits, and you can have a you know a dialogue with a, a bot that is able to explain it and solve your problem. Um, I don't think we're going to see the same kind of direct interaction with a pseudo doc, you know, like an LLM pretending to be an actual doctor. So you know we're watching like LLM companies right now saying things like our you know our model just passed the, their boards, you know. I, I don't think that that's a relevant phenomenon for, for us as you know healthcare consumers, um, and it won't be for a while. Uh, so I think we'll see some correction. I, I hope we see some correction in the you know kind of irrational exuberance around those ideas about bots passing the MLE, you know, and getting their boards and stuff like that. Um, the last thing I think that is is probably maybe the, the one of the more exciting domains of where there's kind of both you know high reach and high impact is the idea of supporting clinicians and their workflows. And so when you have a human in the loop, uh, you actually do create a lot of space for yourself. So the idea of augmenting the workflow, for example, um, there is far too much you know, clinical knowledge that exists in the sort of you know, corpus for any doctor to hold in their hands. But um, if we're able to expose the relevant information in the course of an encounter or in the course of a patient's experience and make that information, the factual evidence-based information available uh, on demand, that to me is an exciting interface and one that I think we're going to see really um, 
gain adoption because it is truly enhancing the ability of a skilled provider to do their work. Responsibility ultimately continues to rest with that practitioner, so the decisions they make are their decisions. Uh, but I think we're, we're going to see some really exciting breakthroughs. So that, that's where we're spending our, you know, our, our work at Homeward is really very focused on these human in the loop um, deployments of LLMs, whether that's in uh, supporting their, you know, streamlining their their um, writing of a note right, in the in the course of a visit. So transcribing, analyzing, distilling, making that note, you know, a, a draft of the note available for that clinician to save them time. Uh, that's a great example of an extender of capacity in, in a way that's really helpful. And similarly, serving up, you know, on the basis of that visit, a series of suggestions is another, you know, really great opportunity. Terrific. Now let's take questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I'm again struck by the fact that I think it's a very similar sort of view from the payer side, right? Um, we're looking at this in the sense of, you know, a lot of these models that we're using to pair people with the best possible match for them are ones that there's a clinical outcome that you're going to potentially be impacting by doing that. And you need to make sure that this is something that's equitable, that's gonna have the right kinds of outcomes that you're going to have, um, you know, this be something that you are doing both um, in a way that is beneficial to the individual patient, um, but also is net positive for you know, the system overall. Um, and I think um, as a result, a lot of the models that are built out in a lot of these um, types of deployments are ones where it's, there's a high degree of, of explainability that's required. They have to basically be able to see all the different features that are driving the model, which ones are the ones that are doing it the most, how you can start to account for that, and then also you have to then start to account for even business logic on top of that sometimes. So by the time you get to the other side, this isn't something that is just some pure output that you can then go back and easily iterate on. It requires a lot more manual labor to get these things to the point where they need to be because there are, you know, are rules around when you can and can't include certain providers in certain types of listings, right? There are rules around whether they can be ranked or not. There are various things you have to consider market by market. And then on top of that, what you're really aiming for is how do I get this member who looks like this to the best possible place for them with um, you know, this much longer term outcome that I'm optimizing against, um, as well as you know, this near term cost that I want to manage against. Um, and so you know, this, this traceability and explainability becomes very important in that process to make sure that you're doing this in a way that's efficacious and safe, but also something that you can really defend over time. Um, so I think you know, we'll continue to see more rapid iteration in that, but maybe not a full shift to a different approach to it. Um, I think within you know, a lot of the generative side, there's exactly to your point, I think interest in how do you make some of these less pleasant interactions and more administrative tasks become things that you can offload. Um, and then to your final point, I think the biggest piece is um, this question of where does it actually sit in a clinical workflow? And I think what people often seem to be forgetting right now is that this is a tool, right? This is not, I mean, we've been, we, we, our, device, our, our devices used to just be tools, right? They used to make phone calls, they'd be calculators, they'd be flashlights, they'd take pictures. Now our devices have turned into things where they're kind of controlling us in certain ways. And so there's a little bit of like this implicit thing of, oh, well, the AI is gonna tell me what to do next as opposed to really what it's useful for is to make you know, the bar for what qualifies as high quality more consistent and higher for everyone, right? So I think you end up in a place where it does become something that augments um, in a positive way across the spectrum of how providers interact with those. So the, the question of where and how you integrate it into these endpoint systems becomes very important, especially on the clinical side and the types of guardrails that you put in place become really important as well. And I think people right now, to your point, there's a lot of kind of like this hype going on around it and even some physicians are getting excited by it and we've seen some videos where people will say, oh, well, I, wrote, I, I asked uh, you know, ChatGPT to write a letter um, you know, uh, contesting this, um, this service that was denied um, and cite references and it'll do it. But all the references are made up. Right, um, because they don't understand. Like it's this probabilistic model that just puts the next thing that seems right, that looks right, that you go and you search for, and none of those are real. Um, so, but the the idea that um, Amar mentioned, he kind of was saying the same thing that I was thinking of when this question was asked was, 
the real power in these is the fact that medical knowledge is so broad at this point that it's very difficult to keep that all in your head and keep up to date on it. So the more that you can train this in a way that allows individual providers to ask intelligent questions <coughs> and say, hey, help me with like, what am I missing here? What are the other things that I should be considering in a differential that sort of fit this kind of a picture? And then there's that layer of human assessment that has to go on top of it. I think that's gonna be the place where you're gonna see the most interesting uses of it and frankly the safest and most efficacious uses of it. Uh, the question will be how do you then give a signal back as to which parts of those were most appropriate and most useful. And I think that's gonna be the interesting question of where you build out the right tech that allows you to close that loop to know which pieces were working. So Jay, you can, maybe you could also give us one or two examples um, where you felt um, that AI has definitely improved the patient experience. Yeah, um, so first of all, plus one to everything that both of you said. Um, I am always uncomfortable in these conversations if we don't like first hit that like, safety and ethical kind of aspect of the question. Um, so I'm glad that you introduced that, I completely agree on all that, um, all the way to the point of, especially when you're like thinking about the clinical judgment boundary, um, for us the pulse has very much also been, how do we surface relevant information to the clinicians? It's not about replacing that clinical judgment um, from, from the story. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about in terms of how um, AI is gonna come into healthcare is in personalization, right? I think you know everything gets bucketed into healthcare, but no two members' needs are at all the same, and not even that same member's needs over time. Um, some people are relatively healthy today, and so they need quick and easy, right? Others have um, tons of complex conditions going on at the same time. They need coordination of care. Someone else might just be starting to have risk factors and symptoms. They might need more education. Right? And so I think one of the places where the technology is gonna get really interesting is in kind of catering the experience for each member so that it starts to actually make sense for what they're looking for. Um, kind of simplifies it down to just, okay, this is what I'm thinking about and this is what's here. Um, so when I think about personalization, there's almost like kind of two tracks um, that we have um, focus on. One is, how do you kind of start to think through what a member's options are, like what's that whole decision tree that is coming down the line for them, and then figure out like probabilistically what might be that route that is going to yield um, the highest clinical outcomes for them. Um, but no matter how much you put into that, right, like in our recommendation and matching tools, hundreds of models behind the hood trying to understand provider uh, medication adherent pat adherence patterns and referral patterns, um, you know, reduction of um, complications and readmissions. You know, if you present all of that to the member, it's not going to land, right? Even if you just say this doctor is going to have the highest clinical quality, it's not going to land because no one knows what that is or understands that. Um, actually, for most people, it's like a doctor is a really highly trained person. I'm not even considered that there could be variation in what they're what they're all gonna, the different doctors are gonna tell me because a reason not to a doctor, right? Um, and so the second part of the challenge, and this is where the member experience really comes in, is how do you explain that that logic or even parts of that logic to the member in a way that actually resonates with what's top of mind for them or what they value? So that in your open book enough in like kind of what that part of the data looks like so that they can actually be informed um, of like making their own informed decisions versus like this feeling like a big brother type of experience, right? So for example, you know, you might say, you know, this is the optimal route for a few patients and it's actually similar for let's say five patients. But one member is really, really focused on getting back to their active lifestyle. One member really cares about their family. They're very family oriented. Another member is really cost conscious. Um, another member might actually understand all that clinical detail and really care about all that clinical nuance. Um, and another member might care about, you know, has the provider seen members um, of a similar community to the one that I'm in, right? So what you surface to them in terms of them having to make the decision of what to do and where to go should be catered to that. What is top of mind to them? What matters to them? Um, and that's the part where you gotta be transparent and help them kind of make that informed decision. Um, so I think that's a piece where kind of, um, you know, there's just so much information out there that kind of like in regards to this decision making that 
that information is not even accessible to the members, and if it were accessible to the members, it would be too much, right? So how do you bring the right pieces through so that they can kind of feel empowered to do it? Um, so I do think that AI has a lot of promise there. Second is what I think a lot of um, the panels already talked about, which is where can you add automation into the system, but in service of improving the member experience. Um, so for example, if I think that a question that I need to ask, let's say about coverage, is a straightforward one, but then I have to wait in a queue for like half an hour to talk to someone, that person can't answer the question, they have to get back to me, they forget about me. <coughs> That's not a good member experience because something that was simple in my head was really complicated to solve. So in those types of moments, I think it's like where automation can really come in, right? Um, you know, how can we um, use technology to, for the basic questions, the things that shouldn't be complicated, you know, get a return on answer um, faster and more seamlessly? And even in the development of that, I think the, the notes about keeping the human in the loop are essential, right? I've been in Included Health for nine years and we still don't have a self-serve solution, right? And that's for a reason. It's because you've got to step through that process of kind of, you know, can we at least just get the right information to our team, get it at their fingertips? Then they can start vetting this and figuring out, okay, where, like, what are the subclasses of information where we're actually getting this right? Okay, that might be what we can sort <coughs> through and kind of directly answer for the member. This other class of questions actually has a ton of nuance. This is where we should focus our team's energy so that they can have the most impactful interactions with the members, right? So it, it's about figuring out the balance more than like jumping everything to an automated self-serve version. Great. So maybe I should give my, my, my own experience as well. Um, so yeah, I heard some interesting themes here. I heard uh, transparency, uh, I heard personalization, I heard um, uh, traceability is a big one, and I heard automation as well. And um, yeah, let me double click on that last one. And verbal, that's the path we decided to, to, to take, is how do, we make, how do we make life easier for the provider, right? And how do we make that um, patient, the provider-patient um, interaction um, consistent across all different providers. Um, and if you're a manager and you're managing, let's say 10 health coaches or 100 health coaches, how do you give feedback to that patient, to that provider or that um, health coach so that, that the, the call that they're having, their interaction that they're having with that, um, with that patient is get, gets better and better. And so um, one of the first things we did is we looked at how it was up today and it turned out that the process of quality assurance was actually um, one of the least innovative, innovative processes. So it hasn't changed in 50 years, right? It's basically um, random call sampling, random recording. You may have been on a call where it says this call is being recorded for quality assurance. Well, how many of these are actually listening to? Um, the answer, according to our research, 1.4%, right? So that's how many calls are being, uh, are being listened to. And so, so we thought that AI could be really amenable to those kinds of interactions where we can actually automate quality assurance and do it in real time. So what we do is we uh, onboard a client and we've got uh, a client's uh, in substance disorder, mental health, nutrition, chronic management, um, alcohol abuse, we've got uh, multiple clients and we're also talking to two major insurers about this. So what we do is we uh, listen to 500 calls, we ask them for 500 calls, we have an annotator who actually sits and listens to all the calls and we ask them to provide the, the uh, scoring rubric of how they would actually rate a call. So for example, um, each um, health coach or each provider has to go through these 10 questions. Like first check PAI, check the patient's date of birth, see how they're doing, check our previous interventions, check how the patient has been doing uh, with the interventions we discussed last time, check of any barriers that the patient has, and then actually make a plan for intervention and schedule a follow-up call. And we do this real time. So real time, because we trained our algorithm, and it's, um, it's a supervised learning model that we use. It actually listens to the call and it ticks off whenever a, uh, one of these items actually comes up. So before the, fit, the, the provider actually hangs up, you can see exactly what their compliance to best practices is, what their adherence to best practices is. So you can see if a provider, one provider is doing better than another provider or if one provider is having a bad day. Or if the, um, we do other things as well, we also look at the pace of the call. So if a provider is speaking very fast, so let's say you have a provider that's speaking at 160 words per minute, well, we can track that. And we actually, we have a, and what if, you know, what if the, the best practice is 100 words per minute for an older population? 
So we can track that and the term in the industry is, is that website nudges. We actually show them a little emoji. You're speaking too fast. You know, slow down. Real time during the call. And, um, and, and uh, another thing we've noticed when we're managing uh, older Medicare patients is they're very lonely. This can be the only call they get all week. And so it's very easy for them to just take over the call. So we, we monitor things like uh, listen to talk ratio, real time. We thought, hey, the patient's taking over the conversation. Watch out, take it over. And then at the end of the call, we give them a adherence to best practices. And then the manager has a supervisor dashboard and he looks at them and says, oh, okay. So um, health coach uh, a Amy, for example, is not is doing as, as good as July is. And she's struggling with protocols two, six, and seven. So I can pull her aside and tell her, hey, this is how you would actually do it. Uh, previously, this was only, you know, they would listen to it like a month later, they'd come and tell Amy, hey, by the way, that call you had from Mrs. Jones four weeks ago, you forgot to do this, this, and that. She doesn't remember that call from Mrs. Jones, it's gone, and it's too late to do anything about it. So we're creating, we're creating this kind of automation, real time, into the uh, provider patient call. And I think that's, that's, um, that's a very uh, effective use of, of AI. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, because being an ex-product person myself, um, we actually do something called topic analysis. So we analyze all the calls that happen for a day or for a week or for a month. Say, okay, so um, things like uh, blood pressure is coming up. Um, it comes up at 80% of the calls and patients are asking about blood pressure. So we take that and we say, okay, so these are the top topics that are coming across the calls. And now you can go, it's, it's a uh, voice of the customer that's uh, enabled real time that's never been really possible in these kind of telehealth interactions before. So you can go to an engineering team and tell them, hey, 80% of my patients are asking about blood pressure, so we need a blood pressure offer, for example. And so that's, uh, that's another thing. One thing that you mentioned tomorrow was um, automating the things so that you know, if something comes up, real time, you direct them to the resource, right? So let's say somebody's asking about uh, diabetic and they have diabetic foot ulcer, and uh, typically what would happen is it either ruffles through a bunch of papers or they open a bunch of spreadsheets, but we have a way to actually alert them and say that, hey, these are the organizational resources, so if this word comes up, boom, these are the things that you have, you can pull up and talk about them before the patient died, diabetic foot clinic, for example. So I think that these kinds of interactions, when we took the, the, the opportunity of looking, you know, exclusively on the provider side, because we believe that the provider, uh, a more capable and more relaxed provider is gonna provide for a better, better patient experience. So that's the angle we took, and we also use LLMs, um, Part of what we do is also provide these clinical summaries, but it's not our core offering. Our core offering is a quality assurance and actually improving the quality of the conversation before it even gets transcribed. So that's what we do with Verbal. But that's exciting. Um, look, I think, I think we, better, uh, we better wrap it up so we can take questions. I know that there's a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs here. Um, I'll let each panelist give us um, maybe two sentences of words of wisdom. You know, um, for somebody who's trying to get their digital health startup going, what's your uh, biggest learning or biggest word of advice that you can have for them? I think it's um, it's really easy to underestimate the complexity of you know any given facet of healthcare, which you know it could appear simple, but um, I think this idea of sort of tracing back, uh, maybe the the sort of shortcut is in a sense is value chain analysis, like what's actually happening, where are the incentives really, and uh, sometimes, you know, this is a bit, it might sound a bit crass, but following the money to really understand, you know, why certain decisions are being made that ultimately result in the outcome that we see um, is, is actually very illuminating. And, uh, you know, some of the watch outs are, if you can't figure out what's happening and where the money's going, um, then don't start a company until you, until you can. Um, and on the other hand, if you do see that you know there is that there is uh, inequity in the way that, that value is flowing, and, and that there is you know whether it's non-uniformity or whether it's showing up in the wrong places, like those are opportunities. And I think that our healthcare system is so um, it's it's uh, there's there's so much waste, and it's all over the place. Uh, and it all, fundamentally is one of the big reasons for why our healthcare outcomes are as poor as they are relative to the investment we make as a society. So uh, I, I think that that's, that's a, a, you know, it's a, it's a framing that has helped me a lot in really trying to figure out where are the problems that are not only meaningful in terms of size and scale, but what's that actual point of leverage to pursue um, where if you're successful, you can actually strip waste out of the system. 
So I think, you know, a couple of things to consider, I'll try to keep it pretty quick. Um, one is, I'll just build the point that healthcare is nuanced. There's lots and lots and lots of layers to it. Um, and so one of the easiest ways to understand that nuance and also understand how things are not going to work in the way that you expect them to is to ask people why it's going to not work. Just straight out ask, like, this is what I'm doing. How are all the ways that this will fail? Um, and then dig in on each one of those because um, what you want to be able to understand is how you can draw that proof point all the way from whatever you're doing to something that matters on the other side that actually has some, you know, in either a budget tied to it or some, you know, revenue model you can build out or something that actually makes it sustainable. Um, and then also make sure that you're you're not building an incentive in that just makes you do more instead of doing better. Um, so ask a lot of questions of a lot of different folks. Um, people in healthcare, I think, you know, especially on the clinical side, they, they, they're a little different maybe from tech in that they tend a little to the negative on things. Um, so use that to your advantage, right? Um, and say, what are all the ways that this will suck and break and not work and why would you be pissed off about it, right? And then you can learn from that how to avoid those pitfalls and maybe find like where the true problems are that they're actually interested in solving. Um, I think it is the team that matters, right? So your, your founding team when you start off as a company and then how that leadership team is gonna grow and evolve as the company grows. Um, I think a lot of people think that if you have that multi-billion dollar idea, that's gonna get you there, um, but that's, that's not enough. Um, I think especially in health, right, the business um, models are complex. You're always gonna have a multi-stakeholder model. Also, the number, like the types of values you have to optimize for as a company is usually complex also. Like hopefully you have some North Star that you're all aligned behind. But like for example, for Food and Health, we have to care about clinical outcomes, um, healthcare cost savings, our member experience, margin, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so to balance all of this in your head is a lot. And for the leadership team to stay aligned in how they're making trade-offs and decisions across all of this, is, is really essential, right, to have the right debates, but then also be aligning it. Um, so yeah, I think it's the team and finding that team with the right dynamics with each other, growing and fostering the dynamics with each other um, is, is the make or break. So let me add um, my, own, my own words of wisdom here. Um, thanks, so I heard from Amar saying about, uh, you know, find out where the waste is eliminated. Um, I heard from Jayadeva saying about the team, and I heard from Jim talking about ask what's going to go wrong and, and uh, work around that. So thanks for those insights. The insight I'd give actually is a very technical one, and uh, it was uh, I, I was really impressed. My, my co-founder CEO Verbal does this really well. That he's got a guy for everything, right, or a girl for everything, right. So we've got a network of advisors. When you don't, and when in doubt, ask someone who who knows better than you, right. So we've got an advisor who actually can help us with, with product design, and he actually helped us get our CTO. Uh, we've got an advisor who um, was actually a nurse, and she was exactly explaining to us where in the workflow that we can optimize in order to solve her biggest problem, which was, you know, she spends 10 minutes after each call taking notes. So she helped us build the economic value. Um, we've got another advisor that helps us with the fundraising event. And so having this network of advisors to navigate you through the different challenges that you have I found is, is really very effective. And uh, building that around you, I think what really is really key to, to building a successful startup. Because it gets lonely, right? So um, when, you need, uh, when you need advice, get the experts in there. And many of them will take equity only. So if you're a, a small startup just starting out like us and you're cash strapped, it's, uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. Build your network of advisors. So with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone. We're gonna jump to Q&A, but before we do that, I just wanna thank our panelists. And uh, this is a true uh, MIT CNC tradition that we, uh, you know, thank you with a uh, MIT branded notebook and, and pen. <laughs> I, I know it's, you know, it's not meant to compensate you for your time, but to really show you how much we appreciate you coming out here and taking out of your day for you. Questions and answers. Let's try to do 10 minutes. It's getting late. Um, please. So, Serena, do you want to help us with the mic? 
So if you come here, I'll just give you the mics. Right? <laughs> yeah, and if you could pass it on to the next question. We'll just, we'll just yell. So, yeah. <laughs> I walked up so I can ask a quick question. Is that right? Should we give our mic another try? <laughs> okay, why not? Go so, ahead. Um, hi, uh, my name is Chika Chong. Um, I'm the Chief Product Officer for Telehealth First uh, Insurance Company. Uh, we just uh, got licensed in two states and launching in 2024. So, Thank you for your insight. And um, one of the questions that I, I, I've been in only in industry for two years, um, but I've seen a lot of complexity in this field. And part of it is information asymmetry between the patient and the doctor and the provider and the payer. There's a lot of information asymmetry. And in any industry where there is information asymmetry, there is a lot of room for you know, different incentives to be applied. Um, my question is, what kind of player in this industry do you feel has the most motivation and best situated to apply many of the machine learning and AI capabilities to fundamentally improve healthcare or to improve people's health? Because it's such a fragmented marketplace and information is siloed and not everybody has the most amount of information. So who, like pay, payer, provider, patient perhaps, would actually be, have the most information to be able to do something about it? Test this. Works. Good. Um, I have to take a stab. Um, There's two angles to your question, right? It's who's going to develop some of the solutions and who's going to adopt the solutions is maybe two pieces. Um, I think it's going to be um, hard for the solutions to be built kind of out of the healthcare systems. Um, that's just not what their bread and butter is. So that is where I think kind of the um, the healthcare health tech companies that kind of sit around and they're kind of facilitating the, the system of healthcare at large are going to kind of come up with the solutions. Um, and then the adoption, um, I think that's going to get really interesting, right? Um, I think you're going to see adoption across all those channels. Um, um, I think the game is going to be what types, like, you know, is it going to be the larger healthcare systems that adopt first or are the mom and pops going to try first, right? Like, I think it depends on what the solution is and what the value premise is for for that party, um, and then also like maybe their risk aversion or ability to try things new, right? Um, um, in terms of kind of how that that system operates itself, in, in terms of their culture. Um, I don't know. I don't have the solutions, but I'm excited to see how it rolls out. I'm, this is, I'm gonna try this, I don't know if this will work or not. This might not give the result that I'm thinking it might, but um, who in here has, uh, you know, um, Blue Shield of California? Okay. Um, would you stay with it? Keep your hand up if you would stay with it, or keep it, keep your, put your hand down if you're like, no, nah, I'm probably gonna leave in the next year. Stay with it, all right, how about like Anthem? Anybody, no? How about Kaiser? <laughs> Out of all the people at Kaiser, how many of you have been with them for more than five years? How many of them have been with more than for 10? If you want to be able to do a lot of this stuff, you're going to need longitudinal data. Um, integrated systems are the only ones that can do that well. Um, integrated systems are really hard from a capital intensive standpoint, that they take a lot to build out. Um, but once they get that volume, they don't generally give that volume back up. Um, I think Kaiser does very well in the Bay Area. Um, I know my wife would never want to get off of it at this point. Um, and she actually did stay on it through her work while I worked at Anthem. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one who has that situation. Um, and I think, you know, the Bay Area, they do a very good job in particular um, with having a lot of providers who are really, really solid because it's where they started. Um, I think the opportunities for a company like that are pretty substantial. So the Intermountains, the Geisingers, the you know the usual suspects in that space are going to be the ones that, if they can really stitch their data together correctly on the back end and make it really uniform, will be able to actually use it in a way to 
really find the causal linkages between what products, what programs, what interventions actually drive the best outcomes and drive the best value for every dollar spent, um, both in the short term and the long term. Um, and they'll be the ones who end up being able to like capture that. The question is, is there some way that tech can mediate that and make it so that you can virtualize some of it? I think that's gonna be the interesting space going forward. So, I mean, I don't know that I meant to play into your answer, but I think that, you know, some of what you're talking about kind of makes sense in that vertical, right? Um, where you really have this linkage between the, the marrying up of the incentives across payers, providers, and members, and trying to keep them in a tighter loop with better information sharing and better management of that data over time. And if you build from the, found, from the, from the ground up, instead of trying to cobble onto an existing system, it's much easier. Um, you know, at Anthem, it's 14 companies underneath the hood, um, sometimes integrated. Um, and underneath those 14 companies, there's like 360, right? There's all this disparate data that you have to work really hard to pull together in a lot of cases. Um, so the basic requirements to get any of these things going just become very, very challenging. And, and the company's done a ton of investments to work through that. And so they're, they're getting to the point where that's gonna be possible now. But at the end of the day, you know, it's that linkage between the payer, the provider, and the member or patient, and making that member-patient kind of the same thing um, that I think is really interesting as a space for kind of answering where AI is going to be able to really help those folks the most and really become a real competitive advantage. But why wouldn't it work, Jim? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that, yeah. system. <laughs> I think just capital. Capital. I, I think it, it's interesting to watch, you know, that we're seeing, you know, Kaiser, um, struggling to grow organically because it's such a massive footprint that requires to do it well. And you know, they're, they're buying Geisinger, which is a huge bet, and you know, hopefully it goes well. I think I'm, I'm rooting for them because it is the model that we can all point to that really works and aligning incentives, like we're saying, and delivering kind of an integrated model of value-based care. It's just really hard to pull off. And so um, I have a, a, a slightly different perspective, maybe, maybe the, an answer that's more about like an interface in the overall healthcare ecosystem because I actually think that the data is showing up, like critical data is showing up in too many places. And so therefore, like I don't, it's hard to point to, I think that's why Jim's answer is like pick two, right? Like it's the it's payer and the provider. Um, I, I think there's something else that's interesting happening at the interface between patients and relatively um, mid-level clinical staff. And if you think about like a population of people and you think about kind of where is a lot of healthcare going wrong today, it's often because we don't enter the healthcare system at the right time. We're often too late. And so if you think about like, what are the ways to trap you know, those, those occurrences? Well, it's to have a much more comprehensive like, catchment, right? Like a, a, a way to pull in information before things get bad. And it's not gonna be your doctor who's doing, or needs to be doing that work. In fact, you wanna reserve your doctor to do the heavy duty, you know, here's a person who's, who's sick and needs my help. You need a different kind of mode of interacting with the healthcare system. It's very focused on preventive care. It's very focused on assessments. It's very focused on collecting ambient information and then directing resources to where they can have an impact. Um, I'm, I'm the most excited about where that's, that's being deployed in things like um, services using community health workers or using medical assistance, which is something that we do. Um, making sure that nurses are able to work at the top of their license. You know, so that entire kind of category of health healthcare labor is today dramatically underutilized. And they can do a lot more, and they can do a lot more to solve this problem, which will, in turn, generate enormous amounts of data that's actionable, and ups most importantly, upstream. It's upstream data that you can use to create a lot of leverage. Great, thank you for a fantastic panel tonight. Um, I had a question about the connection between chronic care and potentially acute events or really visiting a specialist. So how do you integrate, right, referring out to a specialist and then following back up? How is the data working? How is that communication working? I'm specifically interested in the kind of Alzheimer's dementia space, but um, the older population, but would love to hear your thoughts. So, would you like to um, yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, and actually, I think that dovetails really well off of kind of the previous question, too, um, where kind of, as Amar was talking, kind of what I was thinking was, yeah, that's like, um, I don't know if like, 
rather than who in the system is going to start adopting some of this technology first, I think like what piece of it has to get done first is maybe like another way of thinking about it. And I think we think exactly on that, right? We do the data integration across systems, right? So, you know, where you today have you know maybe your chronic disease management clinic is maybe separate from your specialist clinic, et cetera. Um, that's where you get breakdown of the system because now you don't have proper information transfer between and the two different kind of major providers are not able to like leverage each other's insights to actually deliver the highest quality of care. Um, so that's one of the pieces that um, we've been really invested in. Like how do we bring together that ecosystem? Um, one, pulling a bunch of it into our own ecosystem by itself as, as part of that solution, um, integrating across what we do, but also externally, right? Like what is our connected partner ecosystem that we're gonna have kind of with specialists um, such that we can kind of, and how can we lead in terms of, this is how the data integration ought to be done and making it almost like serviceable. Like here's an API plug into this, um, like bada boom bada bing, it gets that, right? Like something like that has to exist in the system for us to be able to scale across. There's just so many point solutions in the country and it's it's a massive problem to actually connect data across, across all of it. Um, so I don't have an answer exactly in the Alzheimer's space, but I think that, um, I think that's interesting. Figuring it out how to do cross-system um, data integration um, is, I think, really the, a massive hurdle um, that sits in front of us being able to then capture the rest of the value that's being told. Okay. Any I, I can just, my, just a sort of state of the state. I'd say this is something that um, I've never seen done well or been able to do well. And so we struggled with this at Livongo um, and didn't really solve it. We weren't able to get people, we weren't really able to close the loop with the person's primary care doctor, much less their specialist. And it was not for lack of trying, it was exactly the reason that Jake was talking about. Like there's just these sort of um, interfaces that are so badly broken that you can today only solve them with humans. Like you, it, the only way to do it now, it may be a fax, you know, like that's kind of the, that's kind of the humans mismatch. So you, and we never had the staffing, you know, to like put a nurse, you know, in a place where they would be calling out to these, you know, we're gonna go figure out who your primary care doctor is, our nurse is gonna call them, we're gonna try to share some information with them, we're gonna try to loop them back. Like that's the, that's the, that's the nature of things today. So if you're looking for like interesting hard problems to solve, <laughs> this is a really good one. <laughs> To ask first. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of random questions. My name is uh, Jay. I was a course six uh, grad from MIT many years ago. Uh, I also did the biomedical track, so I was uh, pre-med for a while. Um, almost went to med school, but ended up working in the data center industry instead. Um, and then I pivoted. I did some work in healthcare information exchange, um, you know, using HL7. And then I pivoted again recently, um, doing a master's in statistics. So uh, if you have any opportunities in healthcare data science, let me know. Anyway, um, questions I have. First one is more of a comment than a question because it was kind of answered already. Um, indeed, we are living in a special time with a, a lot of influx of data. Um, especially you have this theme of omics. Uh, I don't think that's been brought up yet. Um, you know, you have genomics, which is the genome, uh, proteomics, you know, the, you know, the proteins in your body. Um, now people are looking at the, at the gut biome, so you have biomics. Um, you know, you have the blood tests, you look at the metabolites in the blood, um, metabolomics. So, um, if you, so it's just it's partially a comment, partially a question, if you have any comments on, on, on how, what's being done to integrate all this information, um, feel free to comment on that. The lady at the end mentioned that she did some work on computational biology and cell modeling. Um, you know, maybe, I wonder if that's being used in, in the real world yet. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of complexity to that. And uh, the other thing is uh, related to that, um, how do you get the data, you know, you kind of answered that already, um, these big corporations like Anthem and, and Kaiser, 
you know, they, they, they have the advantage of being big and being able to integrate all this data together. Um, but as a, you know, when, when you're a startup, can you get information from public sources like NIH? Have any of you guys done that? Um, gotten data from, from free government sources, National Institutes of Health, or Veterans Administration, uh, things like that. Um, and then another question, just so a practical Jay, question. Let, let's just uh, take a quick, yeah, let's ask one question, answer one question. Okay. Uh, let, let me try to take a crack at your first question is, um, so I, I'm going to pass it on to my co-panelists here. But come back in, in December, we're going to have a, an event on genetic and telegenetic counseling, uh, where we, we plan to deep dive into any of these, um, in, into that topic specifically, right? So everything about the genome and all about the, you know, the 23 knees of the world and we're getting all this stuff done, what can we actually do with it and what it's actually telling me? I don't know if you guys have any insights on that. Um, I, don't, I don't particularly. Yeah, okay. And the next question, um, what was your second part of it? The second part of, part of it was just getting the data. Um, you oh, know, yeah, using, using, using public data sources to train AI models. So I know that when I was in radiology, um, with breast cancer, for example, there was public uh, data sets for, um, for training models on, on AI for breast, but I felt that you, 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 you hit a limit in, in, in terms of how good your model gets by using public data sources. And they ended up, everybody who actually ended up launching an AI radiology thing, but part of, part of it was buying data in order to train their models. We have that here with, with, um, with voice models as well. You know, you're only going to get so far if you're doing generic uh, data sets. So that's what one of the first things we start with is asking our customers to give us 500 conversations so we can do a supervised learning model to actually train it to their particular data set. So that's been my perspective on public data models. I don't know if either of you, any of you have anything else to add there. Um, sure, I'll take a first crack at it. Um, you know, I think one of the things that Anthem slash Elements is working towards is trying to put together data sandboxes where there is um, basically synthetic data on members that gets put together that you can use to understand how your models work and understand what things might be of interest to you know any given application that you have for um, making some sort of an impact and understanding whether or not that might actually play out in practice um, so I think there's uh, uh, there's components like that where if you get connected through innovation orgs or whatever through some of the majors you may be able to you know, find access to some of those in ways that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, outside of that, I know that there are some public data sets. I don't know how useful they would be in terms of those. In my experience, they haven't been, but you guys might know better. Um, yeah, I know there's, um, it's not the complete data, but there's some partial uh, Medicare and Part B and D data that is, that is available. Um, for the most part, um, we don't have too much kind of a, in the free data space. Um, the richest data we have is of our own interactions um, and operations. Um, and then we also use a lot of billing data um, of a few different forms. Uh, for example, we have large national data sets um, which give us great provider coverage um, to understand patterns and provider practice, um, but not necessarily like the complete longitudinal record of our own um, so we have separately from that um, billing data on our own members, which kind of gives us more of the ability to do member specific analysis. Um, so it is a little bit of kind of collecting across like multiple domains and then figuring out how to properly integrate the insights across the different sources. I think uh, I think that's enough. Huh? Yeah, yeah, Rick seems <laughs> a little bit tired and it's getting late and. We want to we want to have 15 minutes of networking and then we gotta clean up. But thank you very much for coming. Please come to our November 1st event, Mental Health Will Digital Win, and uh, we also have another event of the Life Sciences Track that's coming up on October 16th on aging. 14. Uh, October 14th, Saturday, and that's a full afternoon event from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. with various panelists. So hope to see you at the next one. Thank you so much for coming out. For the whole thing? Yeah. The whole thing. Oh, Man, that's amazing. Yeah.